Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for the Tech Guy is provided by Cashfly. C A C H E F L Y dot com. Hi, this is Leo Laporte, and this is my Tech Guy podcast. The show originally aired on the Premier Networks on Sunday, June 19th, 2016. This is episode 1298. Enjoy. The Tech Guy podcast is brought to you by audible.com. To download a free audiobook of your choice, go to audiblepodcast.com slash tech guy. And by Ratio. Take control of your watering with the Ratio Smart Sprinkler Controller. It's Wi-Fi enabled to allow instant access with a mobile app and has automatic watering schedules based on the latest weather forecasts to save water and money. Go to ratio.com slash twit to learn more. And by the Adobe Marketing Cloud. Introducing audio white papers for marketing. White papers read aloud to keep you up to date with the latest trends and technologies. Listen today by searching audio white papers for marketing on iTunes or visit adobe.com for more information. Hey, hey, how are you today? Leo Laporte here, the tech guy. Time to talk computers and the internet and home theater and digital photography and smartphones and smartwatches. And all that jazz. 8888-ASK-LEO, the phone number. 888-827-5536. Toll free from anywhere in the U.S. or Canada. If you're outside that area, don't worry. Don't worry. You can use Skype or some other uh, voice over the internet and call out and, and reach us. 8888-ASK-LEO. What a, what a week. What a week. What a week. First, we had Apple's big WWDC... Right at the same time as Apple's doing that, we had the big E3 gaming conference. Apple's conference is for developers, although uh, sometimes they announce new hardware products. I have to apologize. I warned you. I said, we don't know, we know nothing, and we knew nothing. There were all sorts of rumors. I did not repeat them. Well, maybe I did. I hope I warned you appropriately that there were just, you know, fantasies from some blogger somewhere. Uh, no Apple uh, updated Apple MacBook Pro laptop with super duper LED keys or anything Thunderbolt three ports or anything. Uh, that doesn't mean that that's not in the works. In fact, I think it likely is some basis for the rumor, right? But it's just uh, they didn't announce it now. Maybe they'll announce it later this year. Who knows? If you were, as I know at least some of you were, waiting to see what Apple announced before you went out and bought a Mac laptop, always a good idea. Your wait, your wait is over. You can go buy a Mac laptop. Of course, there'll be a new one. There always is, but it won't be uh, won't be tomorrow. It won't happen. It's happened to me where I purchased a product, an, an Apple product, actually many different companies, but an Apple product once, and uh, got home and uh, saw the news it had been discontinued that day. I bought the last one. <laughs> And, and my reputation began and continues to build ever since. People often say, Leo, would you buy a, a Mac laptop so they can offer a new one the next day? They, uh, they did announce a lot of software updates, some interesting software stuff. That's going to be good. At E3, Microsoft did announce some new hardware, a new Xbox One S for Slim. That will be, I, when it comes out, and they said end of August, will be a good way to get uh, one of the new UHD Blu-ray players. So the current crop of Blu-ray players, players are 1080p, high def, right? But now you're getting these new 4K televisions. Many of you already have 4K televisions, really more properly called ultra-high def, UHD. Of course, if you have a UHD TV, there's a, a dearth of things to play on it. Uh, there's some streaming content. Netflix has 4K content. Uh, some other streaming services do. YouTube pretends to have 4k content but so so highly compressed that it's you know it's not super high fidelity it's 4k but it looks terrible uh it actually doesn't look that bad it looks good it looks crisp but not real 4k yet there are going to be with hollywood's pressing them right now 4k uhd discs from movies i'm scott wilkins had told us and i don't remember which the first few will be Movies you don't want to see, mostly. 
I think uh, the Smurfs 2 movie uh, sticks in my mind as a perfect example of a movie that will be out in UHD. Uh, but I just don't, I can't bring myself to buy it. In any event, you would need a special player. So if you've got a 4K TV, you'll probably be very interested in the fact that now you can play back this new 4K format, this UHD format. Oh, but it does other things too. It's high dynamic range. Uh, so, you know, it can store a lot more content. Anyway, it's exciting. It's exciting. Uh, so that's the new Xbox One S. They also announced, which is unusual for a company, that they will have a new, new Xbox next year. Which usually, when you do that, that kind of kills the sales of the new one, right? Well, there's a new one, but then there's a new, new one. Maybe people are, I don't know, in such a hurry, they'll go, oh, I'm going to take the new one and I'll get the new, new one later. Scorpio, they called it. No word from Sony on an updated PlayStation 4. We thought there would be, but they did announce that October 13th is the ship date for PlayStation VR. And, man, I like that one. If you're interested in VR this, and you have a PlayStation 4, this will easily be the most affordable way to do it. You won't have to build, get a special PlayStation or build a new computer, as you might for some of the other virtual reality helmets. Uh, and, it, and there's games. There's a lot of games. There's a lot of fun games. So that was announced... Uh, let's see what else? what else what else E3 bunch of games you know and the funny thing about E3 is they announce games and they say you know it'll be coming out soon I remember a year ago at E3 they announced a game called Cuphead <laughs> okay lousy name but a funny game kind of done in the 1920s style Max Fleischer uh, cartoons it was a really cool looking fun looking game they announced it a year ago, showed a video of it. They announced it again this year, showed a video of it. And they said, it will be coming out sometime this year. I will not be holding my breath for Cuphead. Although, I, when it comes out, I'll be very interested. Um, WW, I think that, that, oh, one more announcement. I think a big one. And I'm, I'm very excited about this. Now, if you're in the market for an Android phone, I've been saying for some time, my favorite, the one I really like, the one I carry every day, day in, day out, is a Galaxy S7 Edge. I like it a lot. But it's expensive. It's almost $800. And, you know, I understand people, especially with a phone, it's only going to last a few years. It's, that's a lot to pay. Not to mention the expensive data rate and everything. Well, a company that's been kind of famous for making what we call flagship phones... Flagship equals expensive. Uh, but flagship phones for less, OnePlus, it's a Chinese company, OnePlus. They had the phone of the year, in my opinion, in 2013 or 20, I guess 2014, the OnePlus One. I really liked it. Amazing 20 hour battery life. It's a great phone, and it was inexpensive. The OnePlus Two, they followed it up with last year, less impressive. But they've got a new one, the OnePlus 3. They put it on sale. There's no more. It used to be you had to get an invite to buy the phone. Now you could just go to OnePlus.net and order the OnePlus 3. A very nice 64 gigabyte storage, 6 gigabytes of RAM, which is, I think, the largest out there. That's pretty impressive. Whether it's a value, I don't know. 1080p screen, nice screen. Decent camera. It's a good, it's a good phone. Fingerprint reader. It's fast and efficient, effective, and I presume secure. A very clean version of Android, which is something to be that has something to be said for it. Sometimes Samsung and, and the others kind of junk up Android with their own special sauce. You put special sauce all over my phone. I just want a regular phone. Can I get it without the sauce? Well, the OnePlus is pretty much without the sauce. The OnePlus 3, but the best part, four hundred dollars. Now that still sounds like a lot. But remember, you're buying a, a PC that fits in your pocket, that's always on the Internet. That, I mean, these are very powerful. Four, when, you, when you tell somebody, oh, that laptop's only $400 or that desktop's only $400, that seems like a good price if it's a good quality. This is a good quality phone, aluminum. Uh, beautiful phone, in fact. 400 bucks is a great price. That's out the door, unlocked. It will be available only for AT&T and T-Mobile. There is no Verizon or Sprint version, I'm sorry to say. And you have to buy it from the manufacturer, not from your cell phone company. But you can just buy it. And most cell phone companies nowadays, you just say, here, I got a new phone. Give me a SIM and they'll pop it in. So impressed. I'm very impressed. I got to play. I didn't want to talk about it yesterday because I hadn't touched it, played with it. But uh, 
Our friend Florence Ion, who writes for Greenbot, uh, brought one by. She had a review unit she'd had for a couple of weeks, and uh, she, she liked it a lot. She let me uh, touch it, and I was impressed as well. So something to look forward to if you're in, in the market for an Android phone. I've been saying a couple of things. Maybe wait for the next Galaxy Note if you like a giant phone. That, Samsung's been doing a great job with their phones of late. There are other good choices like the HTC 10. But I'm, but I think for the price you cannot beat four hundred dollars. Oh, good battery life. The OnePlus Three from OnePlus.net. All right, eighty-eight, eighty-eight. Ask Leo. That's my phone number. I'd love to talk to you about any of these things or anything else on your mind. If you've got a question, a problem, a suggestion, call me, Leo Laporte, the Tech Guy. Your calls next. Three thousand milliamp hour battery is a little small, smaller than the one plus two. But remember, Marshmallow that is better at uh, battery life and all that stuff. Did you uh, probably she will not, Gollum. But the way to do it is to look at somewhere on the power adapter for that surface. If you look carefully, here's one that's uh, well, it's plugged in. I can't pull it any closer. But I'm looking at my Surface Book, and on the back of it, in very tiny print, you're going to need a magnifying glass, it will say, and the key is, the voltage it'll handle. In the U.S., it's 110. Around the world, it's 220 to 240. You want to make sure it says on anything you bring overseas, 110 to 220, 240, 110 to 240. If it'll handle those voltages, then all you need is a plug adapter. If it doesn't, you need a transformer, and that's a whole different matter. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Phone number is 888-827-5536. Easier to remember, maybe if I just say 8888-ASK-LEO. Website, techguylabs.com. You know, if you remember just that, the phone number's there. So is the chat room. If you want to be in our chat room, we have a nice chat room. I've been doing a chat room on this show since 19... I think 94, 94. 93, 94. Long time. That is a long 23 time. 23 years. I'll tell you how long it is. The original moderator of our chat room was some guy I never met, some, some small timer named Robert Scoble. <laughs> He's now the Scobalizer. He's world famous for being a social media maven, a guru. Uh, but at the time, he was just a chat mod. 23 years. That was middle school. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> So that, my friends, that is Kim Schaffer, who is here as usual to help us with the phones, answering the phones. I see you're wearing your Dub Nation Golden Represent. State Warriors shirt. <laughs> our apologies to our Cleveland yes. uh, Warrior, apologies, Cleveland fans. But we're going to have to beat you on our home turf tonight. It's just the way it is. You know, it's an exciting uh, matchup. It's been a crazy it's, series. It's hasn't an exciting it? matchup. They they keep saying they kept saying no team has ever come back from a three to one deficit. But the Cavaliers, and you know, LeBron looks great. The Cavs look great, and uh, it's been a battle. It so I think been. this is going to be a good game seven. Be. Yeah, it's going to be a good one. Yep. So I have been uh, soliciting, as you as you see, out on the street corner for phones. <laughs> is that how you do it now? Yes. <laughs> hey, big boy, want to call the tech guy? Uh, I've been asking uh, for people to call and uh, give us their questions, their, uh, their suggestions, their comments. And I see that you have, in fact, the lines are lit up. They are. Unaccountably. Yes. Let's talk to Dennis, uh, who's going to be moving into an RV and wants to stay connected. <laughs> okay. Dennis, welcome. Yes, Leo, I'm here. Uh, it must be a nice, balmy 120 degrees in Fresno today. Well, it's going to be that way pretty soon. <laughs> Jeez. You know, Fresno is famous for its grapes, except that it's so hot there, it's really more raisins. Well, that tends to be what we put out there. <laughs> <laughs> That's where the California raisins are from, Fresno, California. That's true. Welcome, Dennis. What can I do for you? Well, I am getting ready to go full time RVing, but I still need to work. And I'm going to be do I'm going to be doing computer stuff that I need to be able to transmit from the motorhome and also be able to do the phone calls to clients and all that fun stuff. So, what is the cheapest way and best way? to keep connected without, because I know that there's a lot of RV parks that will have Wi-Fi, but it will be very limited and, and yeah. can be very congested. Yeah. 
You're living the life nomadic. I'm a jealous person, so that's great. So uh, some of it a little bit depends on where you're uh, going. A lot of RVs now are sold with direct TV or other satellite dishes on the roof. The problem with uh, those, and you, they can be used for both television and Internet. It's a different satellite uh, dish, but you can do the same thing. Is They have to be aimed. So either you get where you're going, you aim it, uh, and you can either do that by getting up on the roof or with a motor, or the really fancy ones, you can sometimes, I can't imagine this works too well, but they will aim as you drive. They'll have motors in there that will automatically uh, aim. And, I, of course, that's what, if you fly in an airplane like a JetBlue where they have DirecTV, that's how that works as well. So we, it's possible. It's, not, it's expensive. It's also expensive service. It may not be the best service in the world. I like the idea, and I think it's gotten better and better and easier and easier, of using the cell network for your data. The, f okay. the LTE network around most of the country, but again, that, like I said, this is going to depend on where you are. The LTE network is quite fast, at least as fast as your home network in many cases. The only negative is their bandwidth caps, and, they, and, they, and it costs more. But if you're judicious in your use and you shop around, you could probably find a good uh, uh, mobile carrier that will provide you coverage where you're going. That's the other thing, right? It, it was, it, you know, the right. Verizon always has these ads, oh, we're the best everywhere. But, you know, it, it really depends. If you're uh, in Kansas City, Missouri, you're going to, Sprint's going to be best. If you're in New York, Verizon's very good. Uh, or LA, Verizon's very good. If you're in San Francisco, Verizon's not so hot. So it really just varies. AT&T's the best in but if but so do you know where you're driving or is just is this, is is it just we're, out? we're just going to try we're just going to try to go throughout the country to see the spots we've never been to and we're going to be driving in a class A motorhome and my concern is that if if I'm using my cell phone a, it's going to get hotter and blazes. I mean, it's going to be working double time because I'll be making phone calls. Well, the, and that's right. And you don't want to use your cell phone. You're going to buy a device called a MiFi, which is a little credit card size device that gets the internet access and then is a wireless access point. So the reason you want to do that is it's faster than using your cell phone as a hotspot. It allows you to have five different devices. So your laptop and can use it in your cell phone, you can use it in your wife, can use it, in, et cetera, et cetera. Right, because I can't take away her Kindle. That just would not work. No. <laughs> nice thing is the Kindle doesn't need to be online all the time, just when you're downloading a new book, right? Right. So oh, when she's playing her games. <laughs> oh, she's got the tablet Kindle. Oh, yeah. Yeah. okay. <laughs> so a lot of companies I'm looking, uh, here's a link to a Netgear 4G LTE mobile brand, broadband Wi-Fi router that's really designed for a mobile home because it's uh, it looks like a regular router, but it's got antennas. So you don't want the credit card device because you, it you doesn't need to be portable. You're just going to put it in the window of the RV. But okay. what you're going to do is you're going to start with the carrier. You're not going to start with Netgear. You're not going to buy the hardware first. You're going to go to the different carriers, ask them for pricing, tell them what you're up to. They'll all have something appropriate. If your current carrier, uh, you'll, you're happy with your current carrier, I'd start there. Okay. Yeah, okay. I've got, I, I use Verizon right now because they're the best in the Central Valley here. Yeah. And they'll be the best in most places, you know. It's just that don't 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 fall for that thing of, you know. Well, nationwide the best. Well, nationwide's fine, but you're not nationwide. You're in a spot. You're in one place. <laughs> so, exactly. Yeah. Um, I would I would definitely look at LTE. Uh, look at the pricing. See if you can live with that. Typically, you can buy a lot of a, a big package, you know, and then they'll charge you for a, a overage. You might want, the other thing, of course, you'll want to do is use Wi-Fi hotspots wherever you can. So when you park, if you're at a KOA or somewhere that has a Wi-Fi hotspot, use that. Um, but it, this is this is for when you're not. Right. Yeah, okay. we're going to hopefully do some spots in camp where there is no hookups or anything like right, that. Right, so. right. So those are your two options. You know, and of course, it's not going to work where there's no cell coverage. So you're, you know, you're in Zion National Park and months, the beautiful trees and... You, you may be distant from a, a, a cell site, and you may not get cell coverage. In that case, you're just going to have to take a walk and enjoy the fresh air. But most places you go, you'll be able to. Nowadays, cell, cell coverage is pretty darn good. Well, I appreciate it, Leo. Yeah, I think that's the best way to do it. I, I, there, you know, Sometimes people use those dishes, but I think that's the best way to do it. Okay, appreciate right? it. And I think the future's on your side. It's getting better and better. Companies are putting a lot of money. 
a lot of investment into LTE and getting better coverage, faster coverage. Man, in, in most towns and cities, uh, even our little town of 50,000 people, uh, the uh, T-Mobile, for instance, LTE is fat, much faster than my home Internet access. It's really, really snappy. The issue, of course, is the cost per gigabyte. But even that's dropping. 8888-ASK-LEO, Leo Laporte, the tech guy. And happy Father's Day to all the dads out there. Hope you're enjoying your special day. It's nice that on the day we all barbecue, they turn the heat up. <laughs> so, hey, it's okay. You can wear your dad shorts. It's allowed. It's allowed. Today is the day the dad shorts come out. I actually bought more dad shorts. My son does not like me to wear cargo pants. He thinks that looks dopey. So I bought uh, cargo shorts. <laughs> I think that dopier. <laughs> I think they're even dopier. It looks like uh, I've got pouches all over my, <laughs> my... What are dad shorts? Cargo shorts? Dad are shorts. They boxers? <laughs> uh, yeah, they could be boxers. I did, whatever dad likes, that's what dad shorts are. All right. I have a dad bod, and I'm going to wear dad shorts. And I'm sorry, kids. Rock that dad bod. There's, rock that dad bod. There's nothing I can do about it. Chuck in Burbank, California. Hey, Chuck, Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Good morning, Chuck. Happy Father's Day. Thank you. You too, sir. Thank you. Hey, Chuck, uh, last week an individual called and said, uh, asked a question if there was any way to connect uh, his iPhone, and, be it Android or iPad, to a television without any device. And you said... No. And I found somebody that has done it. And I have... Tell me how they did it, because I'd love to know. That Well, that's, he's got a patent on this thing, Chuck. and But he will not tell you how he's doing it, because he's in the process of licensing it. And well, it's conceivable. You know, there are a lot of TVs now have a variety of built-in technologies. There's even TVs with Apple... I believe, maybe not, with Apple TV built in, probably not. But DLNA, uh, Intel's wireless display, which I call Y-Die, but they don't like that when I call it that, so I'm just going to call it wireless display. Um, there is Miracast, Microsoft's Miracast. All of these are designed, for instance, I could take my Windows laptop and without any, quote, device, play right to my TV because the device is built into the TV. There's also the Chromecast. With Apple's, uh, you know, you have to support AirPlay, and uh, that's the Apple technology, which is their, their slightly modified version of DLNA. It's not that different, but it's different and enough I, that you have normally you have to have an Apple TV. Leo, I went with this individual to five different locations in one hour. And I went to a library that had television in there. He plugged in a receiver into the HDMI port and put a television. Oh, that, oh, that's a device. No. <laughs> well, what I'm saying is. <laughs> there you go. He's got a device. It's called that little thing he plugged into the HDMI oh. port. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. But he can do this anywhere. He sure. Can... Any TV that supports HDMI will support an Apple TV. And apparently he's created a device that does AirPlay, Apple's AirPlay technology. Now, the problem he's going to have is Apple licenses that, and they're going to take uh, kind of unkindly to somebody who makes an AirPlay device that they don't license. I don't know of any AirPlay devices uh, besides the ones Apple sells, and the ones Apple sells are called Apple TVs. If anybody knows, I'd be interested. It is, it's possible, certainly, to even take some of the technology out of an Apple TV to dis disassemble it, maybe maybe you'd even just put the firm some of the firmware on the radio chip in a dongle. That's a device, by the way. I mean, <laughs> you're modifying the TV, whether it's a Chromecast or an Apple TV or a Roku box. The whole idea here is your TVs have an HDMI port, uh, and you plug a device in that's got wi that's Wi-Fi enabled, and now you can broadcast to the device. Um, Somebody, Scooter X, in our chat room, our chat mod, has sent me a link to something on Amazon called the Wireless AirPlay Mirror Display Dongle Adapter. Oh, that's interesting. So somebody is making such a thing. Um, 
The HDMI dongle is small and beautifully designed with popular Linux intelligent operating system. <laughs> okay, well, we know it's not an English speaker who wrote this. With this HDMI dongle, you can easily enjoy your favorite movies, videos, TVs on an HDTV. Supports ah, AirPlay, uh, you know, the AirPlay without an uppercase. But it is supporting the latest iOS 7 system. iPad, iPhone supports Miracast, which of course is Microsoft's solution, and DLNA. So this is, uh, you know, somebody's selling this device. Maybe even your friend bought one. Uh, the problem with this is it's illegal. It's uh, from China. And uh, the Chinese don't really pay much attention to copyright and patent, especially when it benefits them. So, yeah, and you'll find this stuff all over Amazon that does, does all sorts of weird things. This is uh, unusual because you don't normally want to trumpet the fact that you support AirPlay. Like I said, it doesn't have the made for iPhone MFI. Uh, logo on it, which means it's not Apple licensed, which, and by the way, it says on here, note, not support latest iOS 9 system. Note, not support latest. That's because Apple uh, decided that they were going to put these guys out of business. So, <clears throat> you know, until Apple makes a, and they could, and I wish they would, but you know, Apple is Apple. Apple does what it wants to do. It doesn't, doesn't, it marches to the beat of its own drummer. And it would be really nice if Apple does, like many others do. The Chromecast is an amazing device. This is kind of similar to a Chromecast. It's an inexpensive Chromecast, an inexpensive device, plugs into the HDMI port. And then you, with your phone, it could be an iPhone or an, app, an Android phone, you know, pick Netflix and send it to the Chromecast. And what's cool about it is your, your phone is only the negotiator. It doesn't actually download and stream the film to your TV. That's what AirPlay does. Chromecast I like better because what Chromecast does is it takes it's a handoff. The phone tells the Chromecast device, okay, he wants to watch this Netflix movie. The Chromecast says, great, I'll take it from here and starts streaming using its own Wi-Fi to the TV. That means you can take your phone, you could turn it off and the movie will still play. You could do other things, the movie will still play. When you launch Netflix on that phone or another phone, you can control Netflix. You could pause back rewind, go forward, that kind of thing, um, because it becomes a remote control for it. But the Chromecast is doing the work. That is not how AirPlay works. Uh, although I'd, I suppose Apple could do a dongle that would work that way. Might be nice if they did. Uh, there is a company, uh, there is a software program called AirServer. This I expect to see more of. That puts software on your PC share and collaborate across devices and platforms and uh, this is probably reverse engineering airplay the thing about apple's airplay is it really is a, it is a standard they just modified it slightly so your your buddy has a patented device that he's going to sell for a thousand dollars it's uh, you can get it for twenty dollars on uh, amazon but it's illegal justin savannah georgia leo laporte the tech guy hi justin hey leo great to talk to you nice to talk to you how are you I'm doing great. Um, so I'm looking at, uh, I saw your Oryx Pro on the new screen table. Oh, I love my Oryx Pro. <laughs> well, well, good. I, would, I would wouldn't recommend it for anybody who wants to. It's a laptop that you don't ever want to move. It's like eight pounds. <laughs> I, would like, I would like something a little bit more mobile. Yeah. Um, but comparable. So I'm looking at buying a top-of-the-line laptop from, say, four years ago. But I'm curious how something like that's going to hold up over the next ah. you know two to three and, years and, and the, the thing about the oryx pro comes from a company called system 76 that that sells laptops with linux ubuntu linux installed is that what you want to do put linux on it that's exactly right yeah hang on for a bit we got to take a break advertisers beckon and i for one am not willing to ignore their siren call but when we return i will uh, help you with this leo laporte the tech guy Yeah, it's only illegal if it works. <laughs> Good point. That may be why Apple didn't shut them down. Well, it doesn't work, so who cares? <laughs> Knock yourself out. Buy a $20 device that doesn't do anything, and uh, it's on you. Leo, I'm sorry, Chuck, the tech guy here, and I want to tell you about Audible. 
dot com. <laughs> I love Audible. Audible audiobooks and were a lifesaver for me. I used to have a very bad commute. It was, you know, on a good day, an hour each way. On a bad day, four hours total. Um, and that's when I discovered Audible. This is back in uh, 16 years ago, in the year 2000. And I love it. Now Audible has just grown over 250,000 books in every area of literature, fiction, nonfiction. I love the bios, the history, the tech books, periodicals. Yeah, you can get the Daily Digest of the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal. That's going to be part of your subscription. I'll tell you about that in a second. Language instruction. We're going to Paris in the fall, and uh, Lisa and I are both listening to French language tapes. They're not tapes. What are they? Files. Programs on audible.com. And it's a lot more affordable than going out and buying the Pimsleur system. It, it just comes with your subscription. They've also got the great courses, great college courses by the best lecturers in the world on all the topics you wish you'd studied in college but didn't get around to. I love, I love Audible. And right now we're offering a free audio book so you can try out the service and see if you like it at audiblepodcast.com slash techguy. I'm listening to such a great book. It's not a new book on, oh, look, Roald Dahl. I love Roald Dahl's stuff. See, they have kids stuff too, young adult. We're going on a bit of a road trip. We're driving down to L.A. Uh, tonight. You bet we'll be listening to Audible in the car with the kids. Uh, we got Michael and his friend, two 13-year-olds. I think maybe a little Roald Dahl will be in order. Or Tom Stranger, The Adventures of Tom Stranger, Interdimensional Insurance Agent. What? <laughs> uh, all kinds of stuff. What I'm listening to, I was about to tell you right now, is called As You Wish. It's Carrie Elwes. Uh, who played the Dread Pirate Roberts, the man in black, in, uh, in Wesley, of course, in The Princess Bride. And it's wonderful because it has all many of the people like Wallace Shawn and Christopher Guest and Carol Kane, Rob Reiner, Norman Lear, Billy Crystal, Robin Wright, who are in the movie, talking about the making of the movie. I'm loving this so much. This could be your, your first one free. All you, here's the thing. The, tr the challenge is, with a quarter of a million choices, what are you going to pick? Go to audible.com, pick a book, then go to audiblepodcast.com. Sign up for the gold account, audiblepodcast.com slash tech guy. Sign up for the gold account. Your first month is free. This is the book a month subscription. That means your first book is free, and you get the Daily Digest of the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal. And cancel uh, any time in those first 30 days. You'll pay nothing, but the book is yours to keep. This is a great one. Cormac McCarthy's The Road. Kind of sad, but oh, amazing. About a Boy. I love Nick Hornby. These are all Father's Day books, aren't they? The Room with a View by Am Forster. Uh, I'll tell you, if you go to audiblepodcast.com slash tech guy, take advantage of our free 30 days offer. You're going to love it. And if you've got a commute or just, I, I listen now when I walk to work, do the dishes, walk the dog. It's a great way to fill your mind with wonderful stories. Audiblepodcast.com slash tech guy. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. It's a popper's world. 8888-ASK-LEO. That's the phone number. We were talking to Justin in Savannah. He wants to uh, use Linux which is a free operating system I've come to really uh, love. A lot of you are using it and don't know it. It's Android is Linux. Uh, Chrome OS is Linux. Most of the web servers in the world now are running on Linux. And uh, the desktop version of Linux from a number of companies like Ubuntu, Debian, and others, uh, really, I think, is every bit as good as Windows. And I think a lot of people are kind of... This, this happened to me. I was so upset, frankly, with the way Microsoft pushed Windows 10... I just, I said, I think there needs to be an alternative. And I was very happy. I've always used Linux, but very happy to kind of settle down and use it full time. And it's fantastic. So your idea, Justin, is good. Linux uh, always works best with a little bit older hardware because it's generally supported not by the companies that make the hardware, but by users. Uh, 
Lenovo seems to make the laptops that Linux users love the most. I, it's sad that Lenovo doesn't sell of any version of its laptops with Linux on it. But if you look around, and there are even websites like la linuxonlaptops.com, and see, you'll see that a variety of Lenovo models work great with a variety of Linux distributions. The one company that does sell, besides System76, which is Linux only, and then there's others like that, like Za Reason and so forth, but Dell, of all companies, does sell uh, Linux laptops. They created a few years ago Project Sputnik. I think it was one of their engineers said, you know, we really ought to offer Linux laptops. And so they have offered Linux laptops for five years now. They're pretty much, they are the same hardware-wise as the Windows laptops. They just make sure the drivers are available and that it works with, with Ubuntu. So Ubuntu seems to be the common choice for a lot of these companies. It's kind of the most uh, easily accessible I personally don't like Ubuntu as much as Debian, but I've run Debian on those same Dell laptops without any problem. I don't think you'll have any trouble with Debian on uh, Lenovo's either. So, yeah, I think your idea is admirable. What can I help you with? Well, I'm just curious if, you know, I'm going to buy an older laptop yeah. and use a refurbished. And yeah. Is it going to last, you know, long enough? Well, Am I going to get a few years out of it? The negative thing about older laptops, uh, of course, is that you don't know how they've been treated. The good news is you're going to wipe the drive and put on a different operating system. So you're not going to inherit any of the software issues. But, you, but you know, it might have been banged around. People throw it in their bag. They throw it in the back of the car. So it's you want to look at one that's been taken care of lovingly. Um, but I, I think this is, a, this is certainly a great way to start. A lot of people use Linux on, on their own older laptops. They don't want to keep using Windows on Windows XP, for instance. So they'll put Linux on it. And that's the other thing that's often the case. Linux runs better than Windows on exactly the same hardware. Um, now, you have, you're going to become a somewhat of a... Of a uh, you're going to have to become somewhat of a tech guy yourself because there are some rough edges and there are some things you have to kind of figure out. I personally enjoy that. And the good news about Linux is there's lots of support lots of other people in the same boat and so anytime i have a problem i just google it and usually there's somebody who's had the same problem um so yeah there's some good choices out there i i would not hesitate to do exactly what you're doing and is, have you used linux before i have and i'm you know i've got the basics of of linux and um you learn pretty fast <laughs> yeah so i think i'll be okay it's just i i don't really know if i should try and buy used and, uh, Nowadays, you could get a cheap $500 Lenovo and uh, be very happy, frankly. I'm not sure you need to buy a used one. You'd be amazed at how inexpensive uh, laptops are these days. So, you know, I can't, I can't vouch for any given laptop. You just have to really inspect it, make sure that the owner's been, you know, uh, uh, gentle with it. Um, and, uh, you know, I wouldn't buy it on eBay. Sometimes you get refurbished laptops at places like Fry's. Uh, that might be a better solution. Look at Lenovo's refurbished site. See if they offer. Those Lenovo's work great with Linux almost in every uh, case. Is there going to be a big difference between a Core i7 from a few years ago versus one today? No. You know, that's the irony. Intel would like you to think so, but no. <laughs> okay. Well, I mean, I think that's really one of the... Yeah. That's probably one of the biggest issues to, to solve. The one yeah. thing you're going to not want like is uh, battery life. The Windows, Microsoft spent a lot of time uh, tweaking battery life on laptops. And uh, generally speaking, you're going to get better battery life on a Windows uh, install on a laptop than you are on the same exact laptop with Linux. But there are tools, power tools like uh, TLP that will help you get better uh, battery life on your Linux box. It just it, that never seems to quite live up to the Windows version. You know, the manufacturers work hand-in-hand -hand with Microsoft to really fine-tune this. And this that's just not the case. I, would, I yeah. bet you, you, you know, you can find an old, uh, you know, shop around. I, I bet you can find an old laptop that is maybe new, but, you know, like go to a big box store and find last year's laptop. Um, and you should be able to. Uh, the, th the, trick is, the trick is to check and make sure there aren't any showstoppers. There's not a piece of hardware on there. Like the trackpad just never worked right. Or the camera just never worked right. And LinuxOnLaptops.com will help you with that. All right. I, I have really fun. appreciate it. I think it's I'm ready great. to make the jump. Uh, yeah, I think, you know what? I have been so happy. It's really robust. It's fun to play with. It's great if you like to tinker, if you like the command line. If you're a programmer, it's heaven. So I think there's a lot of reasons. 
Um, but but I would look, I, you know, they're, and they're also this highly proprietary laptops, bad idea. That's why Dell and Lenovo. And Dell's, uh, Dell's XPS 13, if you can get a year-old Dell XPS 13 or two-year-old Dell XPS 13, those work great with Ubuntu. Never had any problems at all with us. Rohit, Fremont, California. Hey, Rohit, Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hi, how are you? I am wonderful. How are you? Happy Father's Day. Uh, I'm doing well. I, I was calling because uh, uh, my old iPhone 5 is getting a little old, and my family wanted to buy me an iPhone 6 now. Yay! It's Father's wait. Day. That's nice of them. That's right. But my friends wanted me to wait for an iPhone 7. Nah. Do you have any idea uh, what that's going to be like? We don't because Apple doesn't say. And, you know, one of the reasons I mentioned the Apple rumors for WWC and how wrong they were is just to point out that you'll hear these rumors, but uh, they're just rumors and they can be completely wrong. Here's what we have heard. The next iPhone will almost certainly be out this fall. Typically, Apple announces in September for a September or October release, and they've been very consistent on that. So if you can wait to September or October... There are some things that probably will make this desirable. Certainly, just getting the latest iPhone is nice because that's going to give you a few extra years of operating system upgrades, and it's going to give you new features. Um, we've seen some of what iOS 10 will do, and that will work best on an iPhone 7, although Apple's been clear that it'll work on an iPhone 5 and better. So it'll even work on your phone, the new operating system. Uh, we expect better camera. In fact, we've heard dual camera. We've heard also that they are going to eliminate, and this may be a negative, the headphone jack. Now, again, rumors. Apple's not saying anything, but the rumor is, and, and it, these things do start to come out because they're manufacturing them. They have to start manufacturing them right about now to have them in, in, a, in an ample quantity by fall. Uh, the rumors are they'll use the lightning port for headphones, which means you'll need to use a special adapter or special headphones. That might be a negative. If I were you, if you like, the size will be the same. The screen, maybe they might go to OLED. There's a rumor they might use the OLED screens. That's one thing Apple's been a little behind on. But I'll be honest with you. If your family wants to buy you an iPhone 6 today, get it and love it. It's It does everything you want, and I think you'll be very happy. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. This is the story. Oh, my God. Look how many you've gotten off. Oh, my God, Burke. I thought we got a special tool for so that. Patrick's brick made it out safe. And I'm actually extracting Scott's brick. Oh, we're destroying the wall. <laughs> we're destroying the wall. So he's kind of, what he said, looks like he's doing is he's breaking up the drywall. Yeah, he is. Didn't, um, didn't Bruce say he got a special auto chisel? Well, we got a rotary tool. Yeah. But is that harder? Apparently it just makes a bigger mess. Still, you still need to get. Away. So what we really are doing is just taking out the drywall. Yeah. If you take out a big enough hole, can you just start to peel the drywall off? I'll, he hasn't tried. He's I'll defer to you guys. What I mean, I don't want. I mean, it gets harder when it, you have pieces of drywall. That yeah. Are together. I'm thrilled that we are able to get them off. Do you think we'll be able? We haven't broken any yet. Looks no. like. No. You think we'll be able to get them all off? Well, I mean, how long is that going to take? Soaked in water. <laughs> there must be a way. Is there something you can soak bricks in that will dissolve the mortar but not Probably, the brick? Yeah. Well, hey, hey, hey. How are you today? Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Talking about computers, the internet, home theater, digital photography, smartphones, smart watches, virtual reality, anything with a chip in it. I would love to talk to you if you've got a question or a comment or suggestion. You want a little hand-holding on the information superhighway? Isn't it amazing how the internet has just become part of our lives? It's not, it's not, it's no longer, I think many of you probably don't even remember that it was any, there was any other way of being. Anybody over, say, 30 probably remembers that, well, let's say, okay, so you're watching a movie and you're saying, oh, John Wayne, I love him. How old was he when he made this movie? And how are you going to find that out? Well, in the old days, you couldn't. Unless you had, like, some book somewhere, or you could go, or maybe a lot of times you wanted to find out something, you had to go to the library. You had to go to a, a building. So kids, they had these buildings that were filled with books, 
filled with books. Like I remember, I remember my college library had a million books. Probably still does. What are they? I'm sure they didn't throw them out, but it filled with. So you go there and you'd go to the John Wayne section and you'd look it up and you say, "Oh, he was 43 when he made this movie." Nowadays, you go. Okay, Google, how old is John Wayne in 1956? And it'll tell you. Three seconds later, you know. And you didn't, you didn't even have to type. You just asked. You can ask your Echo, your Amazon Echo. Sorry, Sorry I'm not... I can't find the answer to the question I have. I know, because I didn't ask one. I have an Echo right here. She's very sensitive. Um, so, I mean, that's huge change. Huge change. And now it's just part, it's, fa it's in the, woven into the fabric of our lives. I think that's kind of cool. Um, kind of interesting. 8888 Ask Leo. You just, what happens is we're like fish in water. We don't notice the water. We just, it's everything around us. So we don't notice that the, and even people like me who grew up in a time when you had to go to the library to find a fact, uh, even now I just take it for granted. It does, you know, okay, so... That sounds trivial. Well, big deal, right? You didn't need to know that, but big deal. But what's not trivial about it is that the what it means is the value of knowing a fact has gone down. Used to be, you know, you're a Jeopardy champion. If you if they ask you, uh, you know, when did the Normans invade England and you say 1066, man, that guy's got a great memory. It doesn't matter anymore because you just ask Siri, when did the Normans invade England? And it tells you. And uh, so fa I think facts have become, we use the word commoditized. They're undifferentiated. They have very little value. What has value now, which is the thing that should always have had value probably, is not the knowledge of facts. Do kids today still memorize all the presidents of the United States? All you have to do is ask Siri, she'll tell you. But what, what's valuable is more than knowledge of facts, but the ability to synthesize, put facts together, and come up with some interesting conclusions and theories and ideas. The ability to take facts and make as a recipe and make something interesting. And that's something so far computers can't do, although they're working on that too. <laughs> uh, that's the interesting thing. I was watching a uh, show from AMC that came out last year called Humans. Have you seen that show, Humans? It's about uh, robots, so they call them synthetics, uh, that are very hu humanoid. They're very, they look just like us. They're not, though. And the disruption in the culture that that creates, because we're all set up for when you look at somebody who looks like a human to think they're humans. And when they're not human, well, how do you treat them? And, 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 and what, what, are the, what is the ethics? What are the morals? It's just a machine. Do you care? I mean, you don't, your toaster doesn't have any feelings. If you yell at your toaster, it's not going to cry. It's a, it's a great show because it raises these philosophical issues. Now, the good news is I think that we will be smart enough if we make androids not to make them human looking. That I think we've learned that eh, better if you just make it look like a, a, a machine that's got two feet. You know, kind of machine-ish, but not too human. Don't look like the Terminator. But I don't know. Maybe not. Maybe maybe that's just because we're not good at it yet. Maybe we'll figure it all out. So that's the kind of thing we could talk about, too. If it's got a chip in it, if it's technology, if it's technology you can get today or what's going to happen when technology changes tomorrow, all of that, 8888-ASK-LEO. And the website, techilabs.com. Sometimes I wonder, though, have we made any progress when I see headlines like this in advertising age, Twitter introduces emoji-based targeting. Ten years ago, none of, very few of the words I think you would understand introduces and targeting, and the rest of it would be nonsense words. Twitter introduces emoji-based targeting. <laughs> World Emoji Day is coming up. It's, uh, it's July 17th. And... Advertisers starting then will be able to target consumers who have used emojis, you know, those little uh, characters, the smiley faces and stuff, in their tweets. 
That means somebody in Chicago who tweets a pizza emoji may get a restaurant for a, a re advertisement for a local restaurant saying, since you like pizza so much, come in and have a slice. Emojis are huge. Twitter says in the last two years, more than 110 billion emojis have been tweeted. And that's a lot of emojis, <laughs> given you can only do 140 anythings in uh, each Twitter message. Unlocking, according to Twitter, unique opportunities for marketers and brands. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. So now, and you know, you've always been able to buy keywords. So if somebody's, you know, tweeting a lot about, um, you know, Johnson & Johnson products, you could Johnson & Johnson can say, I want to buy that and advertise to those people. Maybe, you know, turn them into fans if they're unhappy. If they're fans already, turn them into super fans. Now you can buy an emoji. <laughs> okay. Sometimes when the, the times they are changing, it doesn't have to always be for the better. Warren, Los Angeles, Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hi, Warren. Thanks for hanging on. How are you doing today, Leo? I am great. How are you? Good. I've got two questions for your counsel, if I can. Sure. First question is, I'm getting ready to buy a new laptop, and I'm looking at the Dell, the XPS. Mm. And, Leo, they, they talk about there's a non-touch screen and there's a touch screen. Right. And I'm not smart enough to know what's the difference <laughs> the benefit of the touch screen versus the non-touch screen. And this all started because in 2010, Apple introduced the iPad, and at that time, it was a huge success. And people said, oh, you know, if you can touch the screen of a computer, it's so much more intuitive than if you have to use a mouse to click on pieces. You can scroll with your finger. You can paint. You can draw and so forth. And Microsoft looked over their shoulder at Apple and its success of the iPad, and they said, we got to get us some of that. So they came out with Windows 8, which confused the heck out of everybody because they took Microsoft's You've ever used Windows, Windows 7, Windows XP, Windows NT, Windows 95. You used every, you did the mouse and maybe the keyboard, but you never touched the screen. So all of a sudden in Windows 8, they have they changed everything. They changed the look and feel because if you're going to touch things, it can't be little tiny X's and dots. They have to be big tiles. So they had add, added tiles and they made it very tablety and people hated it. So they put out Windows 8.1, which backed down a little bit. They got, had gotten rid of the start menu. People said, well, I want the start menu. That's how I use it. Oh, but the start menu is not good for touch. And finally, they realized people maybe aren't as all in on touch on the desktop as they are on tablets. And then, by the way, the iPad sales started to tank. So Microsoft released Windows 10, which has touch, but doesn't have to have touch. So it's kind of what you want. If you like touching the screen and big icons and scrolling with your finger get a touch screen but windows 10 works just fine with mouse and keyboard and that's how i prefer it leo laporte the tech guy leo laporte the tech guy 8888 ask leo that's the phone number usually a touch screen we we're talking about whether you should buy a touch screen or not usually a touch screen costs more often though they're better screens i mean you're spending more money for the touch capability but People figure, well, we're going to build that in. We might as well give you a better screen. So sometimes the touch screens are the better screens. In Dell's case with the XPS, for instance, they're higher res screens. So in addition to touch, you get a better quality, higher resolution screen. Uh, if that matters, I don't know. I, you know, I, I, I often say if you're going to buy a Windows 10 machine and you don't know if you can afford touch, get touch, only because you may find that that's, you know, you, you like using it that way. And there's some advantages to touch. I have Microsoft's Surface Book, which not only is a touch screen, but comes with a pen. And then if you're an artist, you can draw. It has, you know, multiple pressure sensitivities, so you can push harder, and it's a fatter line, thinner, and it's a thinner line if you press less hard. And so there's, a, you know, there's advantages to it. Crossword puzzles are great on touch. Kind of more natural way to do it. I just don't, I don't, you know, it's a personal decision. It's up to you. You will pay more for a touch screen. If you don't think you use touch, if you were very happy with Windows 7, for instance, touch doesn't really send you, I wouldn't bother. Now, if you're buying a Chromebook, this is a little different. Chromebooks also come in touch and non-touch flavors. There are a couple of reasons why you might want to get a touch screen. Again, because the screens are better, usually, when you get a touch screen. But also, 
Google has announced that they're going to put the Android Play Store on Chrome OS. And, of course, all Android apps are very touch-focused, as are all smartphone apps. So if you're using a Chromebook, all of a sudden touch might become very important. You, you'll be able to use those touch apps with just a mouse. They're going to have a way of doing that. But it won't be as convenient. So if you think you're going to use Chrome OS and you think you're going to put Android apps on your Chrome OS, which will be available in a couple of months, get a touch screen on the Chrome OS. There, I've over-answered, haven't I? Let's move on. Nick in Michigan, Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hi, Nick. Hi, Leo. How are you? Oh, Happy great. Father's Day. Thank you. Long-time listener uh, since the tech days, call for help, uh, screensavers. I have a, uh, a tablet, a Dell tablet, venue uh, 85830, mm -hmm. and I forgot my password. Uh-oh. I know. How can I uh, get it to my system here? Is it a Windows 10? A Windows 8.1. 8.1. So, um, it, uh, okay. It's a little harder to crack into uh, the passwords on the later versions of Windows, but I do believe Windows uh, 8.1 and Windows 10, although I don't have any experience with 10, do have password crackers available. Um, The you probably are going to want to get a program to help you do this. I'm just looking real quickly to see how 8.1 differs. In the older versions of Windows, there were a number of programs like Loft Crack that would let you crack these passwords. Um, if you now the good news is Windows 8.1 and Windows 10 and Windows 8 for that matter allowed you to log in using your Windows your Microsoft account. Did you ever do that? Uh, yes, I did. Oh! And that's, and that's the password I... But that's the one you forgot. Yes. Well, that's good, because you can recover that if you go to live.com and say, I forgot. You'll have to use somebody else's computer, of course. <laughs> but you can you can say, I forgot my password, just as you can with any other website. And they will and they will send you, you know, reset your password. Do you have another computer you can use, or is that your only computer? Uh, yes, I do. Okay. So that's what I would do, is I would go to the web, and when you go to log into your Microsoft account at, let's say, live.com, um, say, I forgot. And I think they have a pretty straightforward password reset process. Then you'll get the new password. It is it's the reason why I, I think it's a good idea to tie your Microsoft account to your Windows machine. There's several good reasons to do this. I don't use my Microsoft password to log in. Uh, to my Windows machines because it's too darn long and unmemorable. And that's a good thing. It discourages you from having a good password if you have to type it in every single time you want to log into your machine. So what Microsoft's done is allowed you to log into the machine, whether it's your venue or any Windows 8, 8.1, or Windows 10 machine, with a pin. There are other ways, too. There's a picture, and you can touch stuff on the picture. But I, I like using a pin. Use a longer pin. Uh, use uh, use seven, eight, nine, ten digits. It's pretty easy. They're all numbers. It won't be easily guessed by a bad guy. That becomes your Windows login password. But if you forget that, you can use your Microsoft account password to recover it. And if you forget your Microsoft account password, you can recover that on the web as well. The other reason you use your Microsoft account, and you don't have to, by the way, you when you set up Windows 8, 8, 1, or 10, uh, if it's if it's on the internet when you're setting it up, it'll ask you. But you, you but you can you can opt out of it. And if you're not on the internet when you're setting it up, it won't ask you. You just says, well, like Windows Seven used to do. Well, what's your password for logging in? So you can use a, a non Microsoft password for logging in. The reason you might want to, besides this recovery, is that your Microsoft account can also be set up with your Twitter handles, your your Facebook account, your Instagram account, other social media your mail, et cetera, et cetera. And when you sign into a new computer using your Microsoft account, all of that stuff's automatically populated in there, which is very convenient. So I, I do like to use my Microsoft account. I use a PIN so I don't have to use that long, hard password every time I try to log into Microsoft off uh, yeah, Windows. I think that's the best of both worlds. So good news. Because you use your Microsoft account, your password is not lost. If it were, if you hadn't used your Microsoft account, if you just you made up a password... There are also ways, increasingly difficult, as Microsoft's security's gotten better, 
to uh, reset your password on the machine. But this, this is easier. Just go to Microsoft and uh, lo log in your account. Try to start logging in your account and then say, oh, I forgot. And you can reset your password. Alex Laguna Beach, California. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hi, Alex. How are you, Leo? I am well. How are you? Good. Well, don't be grumpy. I mean, you can always go skydiving. That would help. <laughs> uh, my wife is yes. a skydiver. She loves skydiving. She keeps threatening me with that. And I, there's no way I'm jumping out of a air, perfectly good airplane. It's awesome. <laughs> I'll have to try it. I will definitely get you out of your grumpy mode. Now, are you? Do you do this uh, like uh, for fun? <laughs> I just did it once. No, once you did it for one. It certainly will uh, snap you out of it, won't it? Oh yeah, eighteen thousand yeah. feet. It's awesome. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. You gotta do it. Okay. Do it. All right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But thanks for taking my call. My pleasure. So I've been um, watching these uh, live streams on uh, Facebook. Yes. Awesome. Isn't it neat? Uh, Facebook it's Live. It's really amazing. Yeah. So two questions about that. Number one is um, the, more concerning is the audio. So typically, you know, somebody would have a phone and they will take a video of the current. It's for my band. So basically, if there's a phone and it's capturing the, um, yeah. know, the video but and the built-in speaker for the audio, which is crap. Yeah, it's so terrible. It's, it's, yeah. So it's so you want to do you want to do band performances on Facebook Live? Yes. Yes. Let me help you because. This is something a smartphone is not good at, but I do have to take a break for an ad. Hang on. We'll be right back. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Our show today brought to you by... Oh, Ratio. I love this. Wait a minute. Let me show you. So this is a really clever idea, uh, especially in um, areas like California where water is at a premium. Ratio is a smart sprinkler system. It ties to your smartphone and, let's, uh, and, 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 and the Wi-Fi. And then the sprinkler system does a lot of stuff automatically, but you can control it with your smartphone as well. What's nice is this ratio is easy to install. It just replaces your existing uh, sprinkler. So if you have a, a, a an irrigation system, and uh, you, you know you, it, it kind of probably looks a lot like this. By the way, they have a, a outdoor case you can get too as well to keep it if you're keeping it outdoors. Ours is outdoors. Uh, if you took the sprinkler system off the wall, you'd see the wires coming out wires for each zone. You just put these in here, and you see this is a 16-zone version. They have smaller, I think they have an 8-zone version. You connect it up. It has the same kind of dial setting, timer, and everything that a, uh, a normal manual sprinkler system does, but it's got one thing much better. It also supports Wi-Fi, and it supports your smartphone. You find out more at ratio, R-A-C-H-I-O dot com slash Twit. They have created a really great solution. So great, in fact, that your local water company may well give you a rebate up to the total value of the Ratio system. I was talking to somebody in our chat room, lives in Southern California. I think the Ratio ended up costing him 33 bucks after he got the 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 rebate from his water company. Look how much water Ratio saved. They actually had to add a digit over here: one billion seventy nine million two hundred ninety seven thousand gallons of water save because the ratio knows what the weather is going to be it turns off the sprinkler if it's going to rain it automatically adjusts your schedule for weather events so you don't have to worry about turning your sprinklers on or off you get alerts whenever the ratio steps in to adjust schedules for rain this is epa water sense certified look at that you can use your amazon echo as well and control it your nest your next year control for your eye control all will work with your ratio. Uh, save up to 50% on your outdoor watering bill. You'll save, help save over a billion gallons of water nationwide. And as I said, your local water provider may have rebates up to 100% of the cost of the ratio controller. Easy to install. If you're installing outdoors, get their custom waterproof enclosure. It protects your controller in all situations. I love this thing. I want you to go to ratio, R-A-C-H-I-O dot com slash twit. And Take control of your watering. Uses iOS or Android, and uh, you can you can run zones directly from the controller, or you can use which means your landscaper it doesn't have to have a smartphone, but you can also use your smartphone to do it. The Ratio Smart Sprinkler Controller. R A C H I O dot com slash twit, and we thank Ratio so much for their support. Of the Tech Guy podcast. Isn't that great? 
Leo Laporte, the tech guy here. That's Chris Marquardt, the photo guy, joins us each week to talk about digital photography. Hello, Chris. Happy summer. Hello, Leo. How are you? I am very well. What do you want to talk about today? Well, you know, we do these assignments once a month, about once a month. But then in, in between, sometimes photographers want to do some exercises to learn a bit about photography or to, to improve their photography, to become better photographers. So I've brought three little exercises Ooh. that uh, can help you kind of improve your skills. And the first one is about learning to judge depth of field. You know, you know, depth of field is that when you focus on something, the space behind it and in front of it is going to be out of focus. Depending on the camera, depending on the size of your sensor, uh, that's going to be more or less. But it will be slightly out of focus in the front and the back. And learning to judge depth of field depends on several settings of your camera. Um, for example, and uh, that's a kind of an important thing, it depends on the distance that you focus at. So here's a little exercise. Set your camera to aperture priority. That's, that's where you get to choose the aperture and the camera does the rest for you. Uh, on uh, some cameras, that's called the A mode and uh, on some other cameras, it's the AV mode. And set the camera down on a table or a tripod and focus on something close and take a shot and then focus on something far and take a shot again. But both shots have to have the same aperture, but they're at a different distance. Okay, so set the aperture... Set and the aperture be, you have to, to be something, an aperture priority. Set like the aperture. Does it number. matter? Just a small number. Okay. A small number. And take a picture of something right there and then something yep. farther down. Yep. But okay. with the same aperture and then download them to your computer and compare them. And you will see that the, the shot that was focused to something really close, even though they have the same aperture, has much less depth of field. Things are going to be way more out of focus. And that even works with the smartphone. If you focus to something really close, it's, it's very likely that things behind it will be out of focus. And if you focus on something that's further away, you will have a lot more depth of field. Interesting. So that's the first exercise. Wow, I didn't know that. Okay. So close Second, up gives you, gives you a shallower depth of field than, than far It does, away. yeah. Okay. Second one is about the foreground in the picture. And you know, the, the foreground in your photo is actually an important element. Pictures that don't have a foreground, especially pictures that are more on the wide angle side, yeah, they just lack a bit. So here's the exercise. Use your widest lens. If you have a, let's say you have a full frame DSLR that I would go for 24 millimeters or something in that range. If you're shooting with a micro four thirds camera, that will be somewhere in the range of 10 to 15 millimeters. And for any other cameras that you might not be able to change lenses at, just zoom out all the way, go wide angle. Mm. And then stand up and take a picture of a landscape or something. Stand on the ground. It's not, don't shoot out of the window, stand on the ground. And then take a second shot, but this time crouch down. It's the same picture, but this time, because you crouch down a bit, you have more foreground and that will make the picture more interesting, even though the foreground might just be the the... That, well, the ground in front of you doesn't even have to have anything really interesting in it, but just a bit more foreground often makes a big change. I do that a lot in landscapes where your temptation would be you're taking a picture of a sunset or a mountain just to focus on that distant object. But but I like to get the like the the grass in front of me or the or the bushes or whatever in or the rocks if you're on a beach. I don't know why, but I just I know what you're saying though. It gives it more. Of a feel of a sense that you're there instead of looking out at the distance far, far it away. It gives it more depth because yes, because you close have, and there's have, far. Exactly, you have close and far. If you if you watch professional landscape photographers, you will see them have their tripods really low. They will not extend yes. all the legs of their tripods. They will just extend the first leg, and then the camera might be at knee height, and then uh, you you will see them sit next to the camera and take a picture from. All that from from that low perspective because it really makes a big difference. Wow, that's that's a great tip. Get okay, down, last, get down, man. <laughs> last exercise number three: crop versus perspective change. Now there is a difference, and um, let's let's start with the zoom lens. You, you you have a zoom lens on your camera, 
Uh, take a picture at a wide angle setting, choose a subject in that frame somewhere and zoom in on it and then, but do not move, stay at the same spot, but take a second picture of that subject while zoomed in. And then move closer to that same subject, zoom out a bit so it stays at the same size as on the first picture and take that picture again. So you'll, you'll at, in the two pictures, you will have the subject at pretty much the same size, but one is close and one is far. And compare those pictures, they will be fundamentally different. They will be really different. Changing your perspective is a really important thing in photography. Zooming back and forth doesn't change your perspective. It just changes, well, pretty much the crop. It pretty much changes the, the, the angle of view, but it doesn't change from where you're shooting that. So by moving, by using what I call sneaker zoom, by walking closer to something and <laughs> zooming out, you will actually have a fundamentally different picture and usually a more interesting one so and that, that also that you shouldn't well. do that with the zoom lens you should actually physically walk there walk well zoom out and walk close so you get a different yeah. kind of well oh, I see you get a different saying. perspective yeah. and a different right. focal length as right. well right. and that really will make a difference as to how the picture looks and how it feels because pictures where you are closer are way more in your face they are more intense they give yeah. they, they they are stronger uh, as as um, as opposed to the zoomed in telephoto paparazzi kind of shots from far away. What I think really you're saying really is experiment. Yes, Tr oh, totally. <laughs> right? <laughs> Try. Uh, that is what photography is all about. And I often uh, forget to do this, but I see something cool. I take one picture and I move on. Instead of doing that, try different angles, different perspectives, different zooms, get close, get far. And then notice the results. And that's the other thing a lot of people, and myself included, don't do. My friend John kept, keeps a logbook of all of his pictures and writes down different notes and thoughts. And then when he's reviewing his pictures, it's a little more informative, a little more instructive because he can go, oh, yeah, okay, so I noticed that when I got closer, that looked this way. So experiment and then keep an eye, keep a notes on what you're trying. Photographers work the subject. They, they work do hard. exactly yeah. what you just said. They walk around, they look at it from different angles and they, they try to find different angles. And by the way, that also includes, uh, if you have the camera in landscape format, to also turn it 90 degrees and take a picture in portrait format. Um, don't forget those because they will also add a different feeling to the pictures. I noticed that uh, I've always liked to have portrait format, you know, the cameras on its side, I, especially for portraits. Oddly enough, it makes, sense. it makes sense. I like that. But I find myself, I guess it's because of social media and posting. Uh, it doesn't, in a lot of cases, uh, when you're posting on the internet, portrait doesn't work as well. It's and our screens. I mean, we have wider we screens. Have wide wider screen. than we have wider yeah. We have landscape screens. And so I find myself shooting more landscape shots than, than I used to just because of how it looks on the internet. That's probably not a good thing. Take a portrait shot and print it out so you don't have to worry about there the screen. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> I just realized I'm, I'm almost doing that unconsciously because of the issues uh, with, with posting. And that kind of goes back to, you know, Instagram and Facebook and Twitter and all the places where... And you're right, our screens are landscaped, so it's just kind of more natural to make it a landscape photo. Chris is so good. Our, our, we do have an assignment, by the way. It's a technology. So here's a chance to use this to experiment with some photos. You have a few more weeks to shoot some uh, pictures illustrating the word or concept technology and then upload it to Flickr. We have a Flickr group. Flickr's free. It's a Yahoo photo sharing site. It's wonderful. If you're not a member, join. And then uh, make sure you tag it with the word technology and upload it to our technology group. Renee Silverman, our moderator, will thank you and welcome you. Um, just look for the Tech Guy group on Flickr. And we will talk again next week. You'll find Chris Marquardt at discoverthetopfloor.com. Don't forget his great film book and a whole lot more. Thanks, Chris. Leo Laporte, the Tech Guy, thank you for attending today's Tech Guy episode. 8888-ASK-LEO's the number. And I apologize, Alex, for keeping you on hold there. Alex no asked worries. a great question. So tell me about your band. What kind of music? Uh, all kinds of Latin jazz, um, world music, all kinds. So what you've already experienced, no doubt, is that the microphones and smartphones are terrible when it gets loud. They don't handle sound pressure well. Sure. Um, and so they over-modulate almost instantly. So if you want to do Facebook Live streaming, while it's easiest to do it from a smartphone or a tablet, it's not the best way to do it. Ideally, you would do it from uh, something that would give you better quality 
video may, you know, it's ironic. You notice this because you're a musician, but I think everybody should realize that when you're doing video, audio is vital. You can tolerate, uh, especially on the internet, low frame rate video, but but annoying audio, that's it. I'm out of here. So you really, and it's, it's true for a band, of course, even more so because you want people to enjoy your music. So there are a couple of options. Are you using an iPhone or an Android device? Uh, iPhone. So the, there are microphones. Sure makes excellent microphones for um, with lightning adapters for the iPhone that would let you use your iPhone, which does have a great camera, but a better microphone. And I think this would really be an improvement. The Shure line is called Motiv, M-O-T-I-V. And they even make microphones that would kind of fit into the uh, aesthetic of your band, perhaps. Um, I yeah. use the MV88, um, I think it is, um, which is a little capsule mic that fits right on the phone. And because it goes into the uh, the lightning port, it's really easy. But I think you probably would want a different motif. You'd want, there's one that looks like old, fa like an old fashioned um, uh, kind of a fin mic, like, you know, a harmonica mic. And it, it can, first of all, it would look great. They call it the performer. It's the MV51. It would, it would look great. And it can be on a longer wire, which means you could bring it right up to the band. Also, it will handle high sound pressure environments much better uh, than the well, cheesy mic on your phone. Well, I was hoping if there's a way to get actually a line in rather than a mic. But still, even the mic will have a, you know um, different ambient noise. I was thinking to take a line out of a mixer. Yeah, well, if you have a mixer, you're right. It yeah. would be better. So I'm sure people make line in converters. I wonder if uh, I'm I'm th I'm trying to remember if there's a line in jack on uh, any of those Motive products. But yeah, that's what you ideally okay. you would want something that would do line in and use the um, you want to use the lightning port because lightning is digital. So it would do the yes. analog to digital conversion externally and that would give you a better result. Um, Got it. Yeah. Let me I'm I'm just going to search and see if I can see a product. You're right. You're absolutely you right. Why are you doing that? Another question that I've noticed, I mean, it kind of touches on what you said. So if you post a video um, on Facebook, the audio, somehow it gets some to mono and just it, it lowers the resolution. Yeah. Lately, is that something a problem with, it's not necessarily a problem, but it's just that how the inherent system of uh, Facebook is? Yeah, or I think so. I think that that's probably the case. You know, I don't, I haven't looked into what they do with audio, but remember in the early days of YouTube, the sound on YouTube was terrible. They overcompressed yeah. it. They've gotten better about that. And remember, this is brand new for Facebook. They're just learning this. And I agree. They should, they should give you high quality stereo audio if you want it, especially if you're a musician. And certainly that's in their interest. I, you know, I have not looked into what they do. So uh, I, ju I just don't know. Um, I'm looking to see if anybody makes a line in that you could do through the. Well, yeah, there is. There's a company called Steinberg. They're oh yeah, Yamaha. They're a good. They they're, yeah, audio, yeah, yeah. They make audio interfaces that are okay. compliant. To there you go. Them in. So basically, Facebook can see that input when I stream, basically. Yes, because okay. it's it's just in, it replaces the microphone audio the stream. Microphone. Yeah, yeah. If you want to take it off your board, that's clearly the best way to do it. Got it. Absolutely. And I, I actually am seeing a number of other companies that do uh, similar devices. But Steinberg's great. If Steinberg makes one, it's going to sound great. Yep. Yep. All right. Excellent. Good. Uh, right, in man. fact, Shure has one. Apparently, somebody in the chat room saying the MVI from Shure also has a line-in port. Yeah. So if you're taking it off your own mix, that's the best, right? That's like, and boy, that what a great use for Facebook Live. To do a live performance on Facebook. You're going to, you know, I... Even when we've just kind of done throwaway stuff on Facebook Live, you get tens of thousands of views. And because it's live, there's this great element of, wow, I'm watching live. But then afterwards, it's saved on your Facebook stream. So this, if you're a band, you absolutely at this point want to create a Facebook page for your fans. Invite your fans at every show. Put up a sign. You know, it says, like us on Facebook. Join our Facebook group for special free stuff, free performances, free downloads. And then every once in a while, do a live stream just for the fans. This is the kind of thing that, uh, this was the promise of the internet, is that we could go direct to our audiences, that it would democratize 
uh, media. Mass media is a new idea. It's only 100 or so years old. The idea of of uh, somebody buying a printing press and printing a million copies of a newspaper and handing it out or having a radio station or TV station. All of that is 20th century, right? Before then, uh, you know, me media was not nearly so widespread. But once the year of mass media happened, then, f you know, the record industry was created and artists were able to become platinum selling artists, make huge amounts of money. But the disadvantage of that is you you had to have a record deal to have a, any hope of getting on mass media. Well, we're slowly eliminating mass media, replacing it with Internet media, which everybody has access to. Anybody can make a, a movie and put it on YouTube or a concert, uh, you know, do a concert and put it on YouTube or now Facebook Live. And if, uh, it, you know, I, I know a lot of musicians are befuddled by this modern era, this post mass media era, this post-record industry era. How do, how do you make a living as a musician? Well, I think it, it really comes down to the same thing for writers, filmmakers, radio hosts, podcasters. You, you find an audience and you, and you build an audience. You build a community around you, around what you do, around your music. That's always been the case. You have a fan base. And then you super serve them using these new tools like Facebook Live and YouTube Live and Twitter and, and, and whatever else you can find. SoundCloud for sure, right? And super serve those fans. My, my friend John, our studio engineer, is a big fan of a band called Umphreys McGee, hugely successful band without a record contract. They perform a lot so that their revenue mostly comes from selling tickets. At the end of every show, they give you, used to give you a CD, now they give you a USB key with that show. That They record the show, and then as it's ending, they're rapidly burning USB keys, and they're cool looking. He just showed me the one he just got. It looks like a... A credit card, a pass, it's a ticket. On the back, there's lots of kind of information about the songs and so forth. And you you bend out a part of it, and it's a USB key with all the music of the show you just heard on it. That's how you build audience. And and I think the opportunity for a band is huge. You just have to get beyond the idea of, well, if we only got a record deal, if we could just get a record deal, we'd be able to make a record, we'd be able to get on the charts, and then we'd be rich. That those that's gone, or mostly gone, unless you're Taylor Swift or Beyonce, and even Beyonce, I think, has started to realize that. Yeah, and Taylor too, right? Yeah, the inter this internet thing is going to be around for a while. Madonna's last record deal wasn't a record deal; it was a concert deal with a concert promotion company that's going to make records. But the big money comes not from the sale of the records, but the tour around the records. Times is changing, but you, and, and if you're going to succeed, I think you have to pay attention to that. And the people who will succeed the best, the people who will look at what's out there, the tools that are available like Facebook Live and say, wow, that's an opportunity for me. Uh, to, to And it all comes down to directly communicate with the fans. You don't need an intermediary. You don't need a middleman, a record company or a publisher, a movie company or a television station or a radio station to, to reach to your fans now. They, you can get to them directly through the internet. So now you have to do things, you know, to make it easier for them to find you, to make it more desirable, to build that fan base, to serve that fan base, and those and those are the tools that are out there. Facebook Live is a is a huge deal, I think, for uh, everybody. It's exciting. I think it's exciting. I think there, you know, there's a lot of bad content because anybody can make it. So there's no more. It used to be a bar, and if you wanted to become a to get do my job, you had to pay the dues and work your way up and it was hard 20 years uh, but nowadays anybody just get a microphone and a laptop and you got a podcast now the trick is getting the audience 8888 ask leo that's the website uh, the phone number the website is techguylabs.com another hour to come leo laporte the tech guy well, hey, 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 how are you today? Leo Laporte here, the tech guy. Time to talk computers and the internet and home theater and digital photography and smartphones, smart watches, and all that jazz. 8888-ASK-LEO is the number. 888-827-5536. Toll free from anywhere in the U.S. or Canada, outside that area. Skype will work. Yes, it will, and it'll be free. Uh, our website is techguylabs.com. Everything you hear on this show, including the actual show audio and video, 
will be uh, on that website, uh, plus all the questions, all the answers in text, in audio, and video. And then your, uh, I, I really think important, your comments. So if you hear this, if you're listening to the show and you're yelling at the radio, and I know many of you do, you need not yell any longer. Just go to techguylabs.com and you can, if you want, use the caps lock key and just, Leo, you're wrong, and type it in there. And the idea is that over time, uh, the website will get more and more answers and more and more different answers and suggestions. And it just become a great resource for anybody who wants to find something. And that's why it's free. There's no sign up. You just, and there's a search engine on it. And it's very easy to find what you need. Techguylabs.com. James Huntington Beach, California. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hi, James. Hello. Happy Father's Day. Thank you, James. Are you a father? <laughs> no, that was my daughter. <laughs> oh, it didn't sound like it, James. What's your daughter's name? Tara. Thank you, Tara. Did you? What did you do? What did Tara do for you for Father's Day today? Did you get a tie? Did I get a tie? No. What'd you give Daddy? What'd you give Daddy? Um, I got him some pants. Pants, always good. Every father should have some. That's excellent. Good choice. Were they fancy pants? What kind of pants were they? Um, they were um sharp pants. Sharp. Yes, Dad's a sharp dresser. What a sweetie. Thank you, James. It's nice to meet Tara. Thank you, Tara. Happy Father's Day. Thanks, Leo. Hey, a quick question. I've got a, uh, a Vizio 80-inch television. I want to watch the uh, nice. NBA championship today. Yeah, so do I. <laughs> uh, I. I don't have a cable account, but uh. I have cable access. So you have internet, high-speed internet, and what you'd like to do is watch the game. I don't know if the NBA is putting it on the internet or not. They are. They're, they're putting it on Channel 7 and ESPND. Uh, okay. Okay. I have an iPad Pro, okay, yeah. and my dad's coming over, and he's got a DirecTV account, so we're going to uh, get it through the iPad Pro Yeah. and then plug it into the Vizio. Perfect. Okay. Now, I plug it into the Vizio... And on the ESPN D, which is a Spanish language ch uh, channel, I can get the picture and the game, no problem. Okay. But when I play the ABC, it uh, it displays the sound, but not the picture. Oh. It gives me the error message, uh, the display. Uh, I yeah. guess the scaling or something's too much for the television. <laughs> so how are you connecting the iPad to the TV? Uh, there is a. The lightning port that connects to the iPad yeah. that branches off to an HDMI Oh, okay. Cable. Yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. And I tried the various HDMI connections, but it's not receiving. It, again, all I do is get the audio through the ABC channel, but I get the full picture through the ESPN-D. So, so ESPN is a 720p signal. Okay. That was what I was thinking. Yeah. I think the ABC is just too much for the television. Is that correct? I don't know. It must be 1080i that... Your, your Vizio could handle 1080p easy. Yeah, well, yeah. I tried it, like I said, I connected between the various HDMI ports, both the, the 1080p port and the regular one, and it, it just gives me the same message. That is very strange. I'm not sure. It's saying the resolution. Yeah. I wonder, I'd be more like inclined to think that it's copy protection. Okay. And um, one of the things uh, that... Copy protection does, HDCP does, is if it says this is not HDCP compliant, whatever you're doing, and it might not be because Apple's famous for not playing along with copy protection. Okay. Uh, then what it does is it downsamples the video to four uh, to 480 or actually more like 400i to, to bad quality. Okay. And maybe that's what the problem is. Now, you should be able in the menu on your Vizio see what you should be able to see what you're getting. Hmm. And, Any idea where I'd find that? Oh, uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> let me think. Um, how could he see what he's going to see? Um, somewhere there's information about the signal, and I just I'm trying to remember. Okay. I don't. The problem is I have a Vizio, but I don't remember the the, the okay. layout. Somewhere there'd be a way to see that. How do you choose? You're choosing an HDMI port, right? Yeah. He, I'm pretty he, sure you can say, let me see what you're getting on the HDMI port. Certainly the first time you get a signal there, it usually says. Hmm, okay. So yeah, I haven't noted I, that. It could sure. be that it's not too high. In fact, for that TV, I don't think it could be too high. I think it's too really? low. 
The interesting thing is, Leo, when I log into the, the ABC web page, it displays beautifully on the television, but, but the minute I try to stream it, it just... That might be copy protection. Yeah. That might be copy protection. Okay. So, um... Hmm. The other option is to get a, a digital, I guess, terrestrial antenna and try it that route. You could. You don't have an Apple TV, huh? No, I don't. That's the other way to do it. The Apple TV will allow you to stream from the iPad to the TV and will okay. handle all those nasty issues. Okay. Um, it, I hate to say go out and get an Apple TV. You might get, but, you, you know, if you don't have it, what, one of them, that might be useful. Uh, and, of course, you could do it over the air. You're, you're in the area of uh, Huntington Beach. You should be able to get uh, your... Yeah, I, I checked the signal strength. It looks like everything's strong. Oh, in here. yeah. It should be very strong. So yeah. I'm thinking that's the path of least yeah. resistance. yeah. It does sound like it's a copy protection issue, especially since you can see it on the web. Yeah. And then as soon as you go to the direct stream, it says, oh, I'm not going to do this. And video is where they would mess it up. So that sounds right. Okay. I suppose you could watch the uh, Spanish picture and listen yeah. to the English <laughs> Worst case scenario. <laughs> description. Yeah, you know, that's another thing you do. Turn on the radio. Listen on the radio and, yeah. uh, and then just turn off the volume, the Spanish volume, and watch the Spanish picture. There you go. There you go. That's hey, the cheap. Thank you for the input. Leo. Cheap have a skate. Good Father's Day. Hey, have a great game. Go Warriors. What kind of Warriors fans up here in the Bay Area? Just a little bit. It's going to be no matter what. It's going to be a tough game. Those Cavs are tough, and they and LeBron doesn't want to lose again. You could tell. He did not want to go down. So we shall see. Last game of the season. You have four hours to play an antenna. That's what the chat room says. You know, the good reason to get an antenna is that the best HD signal you're going to get, bar none, is over the air. It's the least compressed, the highest quality. And as long as you have a strong signal, it's going to look great. Digital's funny, and that's, by the way, it's all digital now. You're not getting any analog stations. Analog, remember ghosting, and you'd get f snow. And remember those days, and signal would roll and things like that. That's because as the analog signal degraded, the picture would degrade. Digital doesn't work that way. It either works or it doesn't. Sometimes when the digital's very weak, you'll see kind of weird digital artifacting and it'll just go black. So if you can get a good signal, a decent signal, if you can see a picture, it'll be a good picture. It'll be a nice, crisp, strong picture. Um, it might be a worthwhile investment get an outdoor antenna or even an indoor antenna if you're, you're, you're close enough. I think you are. 8888 Ask Leo Sid's in Valencia, California. Hi, Sid. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hi. I have a, um, a dilemma, and I hope you can help me with. I went to go uh, buy a TV, a 40-inch TV, and they told me that uh, I should get a 4K. So when I called <laughs> Time Warner, Time Warner said that they don't have Yeah. The There's no 4K on your cable, uh, and there may not be on your cable for some time. So... A 40-inch set don't get 4K. It's too small to make a difference. It is? Yeah. Just get 1080p. It's fine. 4K is coming. If you were going to buy a 4K set, I'd say make sure you get one that's that's uh, UHD premium. That's the new standard. UHD premium means it'll be compatible with future signals, not just from Time Warner, but the new Blu-ray players, online signals. It'll give you HDR. But on a 40-inch screen, it's too small to notice the difference. So save your money so that next year you can buy a bigger 4K screen. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Our show today brought to you by Adobe Marketing Cloud. Oh, this is so cool. So you've all, you know, heard about white papers. Adobe has these great white papers on marketing. Teach you all sorts of marketing skills. Things like learning the difference between interaction metrics, engagement metrics, value metrics. It's going to help you figure out which part of your creative is working. Creating personalized content that's relevant to customers using predictive analysis. Creating a 360-degree view of each customer, no matter where they're interacting with your brand. If you are in brand marketing, you've got to learn this stuff. But who has time to read a white paper? And frankly, you go to bed with a white paper, you're going to go to sleep fast. Now they got a better way. It's the audio white papers for marketing. They put them up on iTunes. They're free from Adobe. You can find out more at adobe.com. They're brought to you by the Adobe Marketing Cloud. If you're a marketing professional, a business owner, if you just want to stay up to date on the latest marketing trends and technologies... You're going to love Adobe's audio 
white papers for marketing. And all you have to do is go to iTunes and search for audio white paper for marketing and Adobe, and you can listen to them. Adobe has a link also on their blog with a funny picture of Malcolm McDowell. That's cool. They got a lot of good narrators. And it's right on uh, SoundCloud or iTunes Radio or on Spotify. But just go to iTunes and you can you can listen to these directly. Adobe's Audio White Papers for Marketing from the Adobe Marketing Cloud. They're free. They're great. You will learn. And you don't have to fall asleep reading a white paper in bed. You can listen uh, on the way home from work or the way to work or while you're shaving or whatever it is. Great way to learn. Keep up to date with the latest trends and technologies in marketing. Adobe's Audio White Papers for Marketing. It's on iTunes or visit adobe.com for more information. And we thank Adobe. We love you, Adobe, for supporting the Tech Guy podcast. Leo Laporte, the Tech Guy, 8888. Ask Leo. That's the phone number. We're heading into a heat wave in Southern California. And I'm going to be driving to, I'm going to, uh, somebody told me it's going to be 108 degrees. I'm going to Universal Studios tomorrow. It's going to be 108 degrees. So it'll be the Tech Guy in a tank top. Ooh. <laughs> oh, man. And then I'm looking on the internet, and it says Universal Studios is making a big press announcement Tuesday. <laughs> I'm going to miss it. Tuesday. Some big thing going on. But I, what I want to go to is the Harry Potter land, Hogsmeade. You're going to have some butter beer. <laughs> you can get yourself a wand. But Hogsmeade at 108 degrees, it's not going to be good. Ay, ay, ay. Ay. Judy, Los Angeles. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hi, Judy. Oh, hi, Leo. How are you? I can believe I, I can get to you. Well, it's not <laughs> easy, I know. I am almost eight years old, and I'm so far behind in tech talk. So uh, please be patient with me. No problem. Uh, I have this thinking from listening to you and those who calls you, uh, I like to to scan documents mostly, and I'm thinking of using a smartphone rather than my scanner. Really, really, really slow like like that. I have a very old uh, laptop. Well, and are, the, are you doing genealogy? Are these pictures? What are you scanning? No, it's just for my own. I'm just learning. You oh, know, I'm so behind in technology. You're scanning in newspaper articles and magazine articles. No, no. What I'm thinking is I'm scanning receipts. Ah, smart. Okay. And, and then, like for example, do I need another app so that I can organize them into like 2016, mm. or 2015? You know. Okay, so. This was a very big category a couple of years ago. It was a company called Neat Receipts. Yeah, I, I, I think I saw that little thing there at Staples before. Yeah, they make a special scanner and special software that recognizes that it's a receipt, and mm -hmm. it recognizes the numbers, and it kind of does this table for you and all that stuff, it automates it and stuff. Yeah, it's expensive, and it's kind of cool. Um, I think a lot of people now uh, use their smartphone and just take a picture of the receipt, to be honest with you. I'm thinking of the Note 4 because it has this micro SD card. Yeah, I think you'll like that. Well, Note 5 does, not the Note 4. The, oh. the Note 4 did not have a micro SD card. The, note, the newest Note, Galaxy Note from Samsung does. It, didn't, it did not have an... Last year's did not. The Note 4 does not? No, only the Note 5 does. Ah. Uh. Uh, and uh, like uh, what I like also is that it can it, the 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 battery is removable. No, <laughs> no, no. That's the Note Three. <laughs> what? So the the Note Four. Let me think if I'm. Uh, no, I'm sorry. I, you're right. I take it back. It was the Note oh. Five. You're right. The Note Five was the one you couldn't take the battery out. Yeah. Right, yeah. The Note 4 you can, and it does have an SD card. So I am so sorry, Judy. See, you know more than I do about technology. No. I am so <laughs> worried about catching up on this young guy. I gave my mom a Note 4. She's she's 83. Yeah. Loves it because it's so big. She likes the stylus. She can draw pictures and stuff. She really loves it. I'm visioning the 
weird also. I go to Braille Institute, so I like the bigger font. Yeah, if you have some vision, yeah. you can make it bigger, and uh, they, you can make the text bigger, and it's easier to read, yeah. Right. I think you'll like the Note 4. That's a very good choice, actually. And see, then you don't need a scanner. You just take pictures of the receipt. And then organize them into uh, albums instead sure. of folders? Yeah, well, here's what I would do. Yeah. Uh, there's a free program from Google called Photos. Uh -huh. And you can, I think it comes on the Note 4, but if it doesn't, you can download it. And it, and you turn on, there's a setting in it that says, upload every picture I take to Google Photos. Uh -huh. And then you could, if you wanted to, make folders, organize it, or and just or just leave it there and you can even search. And it's very handy. And then, then it's not just on the phone. If you lost the phone, you still, your receipts are stored safely on Google. Eventually, if I learn a little bit more, I will scan, uh, like, for example, medical records or, yeah. or bank records, things like that. More and more, uh, these things are already digital. So, for instance, you could say to your bank, stop sending me paper statements. They would love that. That costs them money. I'll take a digital statement, and then you don't have to scan it at all. You just go online and you download it. Um, I'm not good at that yet. I'm not gone that far yet. So. Well, what I'm saying is that scanning, which was a very popular thing to do, is becoming less so because, frankly, we have less paper to deal with. Most of the stuff now is digital. In fact, more and more I'll go to a store and buy something, and they'll say, if you go to the Apple store and buy something, they'll say, would you like a printed receipt or shall we just email it to you? And then it's in your email. You don't even have to scan yeah. it. I am still that uh, old, stubborn, you know, old lady, you know, stubborn lady that I still like this. <laughs> well, I would recommend rather than investing in the neat receipts and all the special software, just use your Note 4 if you're going to get one of those. You, it has a very good camera. Take yeah. a picture of the receipt. Yes. Have that Google Photos so it's uploaded and saved, and then you can use it if you want to put it in folders and I, stuff. How about if I save that on the micro SD card as an outside? You can, but here's the thing. If you lose the phone, you're not going to want to take the micro SD card out of the phone all the time. Leave it in there. That's just extra storage. Better to have it use the Internet and mm -hmm. store it on the cloud. You've heard people talk about the cloud, right? Yeah, you are always talking always about... Always this cloud, yeah. cloud this, cloud right. that. All that is is the Internet. You know why they call it the cloud? Because when people draw the Internet, they draw a fluffy little cloud. <laughs> That's all. So when we say the cloud, we're just talking about the Internet. And so I'm listening to you without sometimes with just a vague idea of what you're I know. about. I know. It sounds like a foreign language now, you know, with the Twitter and the and the Google, and it sounds like I'm baby talk. I am ESL too, so uh, <laughs> I, I'm trying my best. It's, it's a great challenge, you know. Yeah, but I'm. You know what? I love it that you're doing it, Judy. Yeah, I am. Uh, I'm doing all I can to, uh, you know, to catch up on this uh, young guys. I'm a little angry because grandmothers before uh, helped the the children with their homework. Now it is the grandson or the granddaughter who help their grandmother with. Well, they should. Yeah. They should, and you know, it's a great way to talk to them and, and get interact with them. They love showing off to their grandma, and uh, it's a great thing for you to learn. There's lots of useful things you can do with it. You know, I think email is amazing. My mom uses email. I've got her texting with her phone, so she sends me texts with lots of little emojis in them, little hearts and flowers, and she loves the emojis. So you should try that, too. I think you'd have fun texting uh, your grandchildren. You think that it will work, uh, the Note 4 will work if, uh, you know, I try my best, you know, to learn it. it is yes! A thing, you know. Get a Note 4. I think uh, that's a great choice. Take pictures of your receipts. Use Google Photos to storm. You're, you're on the right track, Judy. And then play with that for a while and then call me back in a month or two and, and uh, I can help you with the next step. It's a journey. It's all a journey. You're going to have a great time. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. 8888-ASK-LEO, the phone number. Uh, Judy, West Los Angeles. You're next. Hi. Oh, wait a minute. I just talked to Judy. No, no there's another Judy. Judy. There's another Judy. Hi, Judy. Hi. You know when you go to Universal and it's over 105, you have to wear your monocle and a bow tie. <laughs> and nothing else. That's I'll look like a Chippendale dancer. 
there you go. A superannuated Chippendale dancer. Yeah, 100, 108 degrees. Am I gonna? Am I crazy? What are we gonna do here? I hope they. We will see that, and you will just love Harry Potter. We'll just say. Thank have you for coming on this day? Ha, have you been to the Harry Potter yet? Absolutely not. I don't like Harry Potter. <laughs> <laughs> what do you got against the boy wizard? What's wrong with that? I tried. I tried. <laughs> My grandson, he loves it. Oh, yeah. it all. The kids I love it. You get through it. Oh, yeah. I don't know. No, you know, it's not that well written, I'll be honest with you, but... <laughs> you can't you can't say that out loud. People say you're crazy. That's J.K. Uh, Rowling. Yeah. She's the I richest guess. woman in England after the Queen. Could not get through it. Could not get through it. Sorry, yeah. but I hope I can get through this part because okay. I'm listening to all these complicated things, and mine is rather simple. I have two questions, quick questions, but I am frustrated because um, I am not a computer whiz of any sort, but I do send emails, and I get wonderful, clever, and fun emails sent to me, and lately they will not forward to another person, and I really want to share them. Um, so what happens when I send them, it, it either uh, consolidates over on the left-hand side of the page and scrolls down, and you can barely read it because the text is all underneath each other. Yeah. Or the pictures won't transfer on down, and I so I have I have one of It's trying emails. to. Can I just say it's trying to protect your friends and family from your forwards? <laughs> it actually is, uh, but in, not in the way you think. It's not making a ju value judgment on the things you're forwarding, but it is right. true that uh, uh, these uh, HTML emails with a lot of attachments are have become a security risk. So, uh, are you using Outlook? What are you using would, for email? I, I would just use my um, Yahoo. Yahoo. Oh, you're using your Yahoo mail. All right. So yeah. you, you're reading an email and you say, oh, i got to send this to, to the kids. And you press yeah. the forward button, right? right? Right. And instead of just forwarding the email intact, it's squeezing it down and making it worse. Well, it'll take the pictures away. It will take the um, the text and bring it over to the left hand side and oh, make it meet yeah. each other. Yeah. And I never had that trouble before. So what's the new virus? Yeah, it's not. It's it's how Yahoo has changed. I guess how it handles forwards. The th the normal way to do a forward, the right way to do a forward, is to forward the mail exactly as it came, intact, including attachments. That's normally if you reply to an email. The attachment, or you, you, you add somebody as a CC, the attachments will not get uh, attached in the reply because they figure, oh, well, they already saw that. But in a forward, in theory, it's going to send all, all the stuff. Uh, and, but I think, it, yeah, I think it might have something to do with not wanting to attach all that stuff. Um, I'm, I'm actually going to log into my Yahoo Mail right now. And it's see. very frustrating because there's some really good texts that come through. And and the pictures are totally, I mean, if there's some wonderful pictures of, yeah. I don't know, butterflies <clears throat> or animals or something, it, it, it just deletes it totally. Yeah. I, I have to think it has something to do. All right, so I'm looking at my Yahoo Mail. And mm -hmm. under the, let's see, where is the forward button? I can have, uh, oh, there it is. It's a right arrow, isn't it? So you're using that right pointing arrow, not the left pointing arrow, but the right pointing arrow. Just it just says forward. Yours says forward. Oh, mine does not. Mine has an arrow on it. It's graphical. So I'm not sure. Uh, and you use oh now is this through your internet service provider or is this your own account? It's at the library. It's at the library. Their yeah. browser may have may be older too. So normally what I see is I have a left, curvy left arrow, which is reply to sender. I have two curvy left arrows, which is reply to all, and I have forward, which is a right arrow, or shift F would do the same thing. When I do it, it is in fact preserving intact the whole uh, darn thing, uh, exactly as it was. So I'm, I'm wondering if the library has done something or... I just don't know. I don't know what's going on with the libraries. Uh, maybe the library, library's browser isn't uh, doing all it's supposed to do. 
Uh, all I can say is when I'm doing this on my Yahoo Mail, it's exactly right. It's doing what I expect, which is a perfect replica yeah. of the original. Well, it used to do that, and it doesn't do it anymore. Yeah. And it's very frustrating because there's some wonderful things that are going over the Internet that are really... Have you tried... Funny. Yeah, I know. Have you tried sending it and then um, asking your recipient, Did you? what did it look like? Because maybe it just looks that way on your page, but the, the email will look yeah. all right when they get it. No, they're not getting it. They're not getting it. No. I can only think it's something the library has done in the browser settings to discourage uh, this kind of email because HTML email uh, is a security problem. And I can only think, I'm just looking at my browser. Now, I'm using, in this case, I'm using Google's Chrome browser. Um, I don't know what Internet Explorer does. Maybe Microsoft is doing it. Uh, or you're using the older version of a Yahoo Mail client, but the forwards work here. So I'm afraid, unfortunately, I can't tell you what to do differently. Send it to yourself. Forward it to yourself just to see what it looks like when when, when you forward it. But otherwise, I, I'm afraid I don't know uh, if they're doing something differently, if they're using a weird browser or an old browser, or, you know, you might ask a librarian, forwards don't work as they used to. Did you guys change anything? I'm very puzzled. I don't know. Anybody uses Yahoo email, if you if you have a suggestion for Judy on uh, what's going on here, all I can say is it's, it's working normally for me, so I don't know exactly what's uh, what's wrong there. Uh, but we do have another segment. Maybe uh, maybe if you know, you can call me, 8888-ASK-LEO. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. I hope you're all having a wonderful Father's Day. And uh, if you're in the Southern California area, I hope you're staying cool. We'll have more right after this. 8888 ask Leo. Uh, Ed is in Crossville, Tennessee. Hello, Ed. Leo Laporte here. Hey, hey, Leo. Hey, Ed. Hey, and have a good vacation. I'm um, so I'll be back by next week. I'm just taking the <laughs> middle of the week off, but thank you. Well, I've got a 13 inch MacBook and a Kenwood TS2000. I'm blind, and I use my old Dell uh, desktop to control my computer. Now, I'm trying to hook up an RS-232 using the USB RS-232 connector, and I can't find a COM port. It won't initiate communication between my radio and my computer. It has a baud rate, but it won't. I cannot find a COM port. <laughs> and I Are you punking me? Is, is this Ashton Kutcher? Are you punking me? Is this Steve-O? All right, so the Kenwood is a radio that apparently takes... A serial port interface. Is that right? Correct. And so there's a way to control the radio. Is it like... This, By the way, Siri just said, okay, I found something on the web for serial port interface. Thanks, Siri, but n n good try, but no cigar. <laughs> so, <clears throat> so, so is it a regular, just like listening to the radio radio, or is it a ham radio? Oh, it's a TS2000 Kenwood uh, ham radio. It's a ham. Okay, that's what it sounds like. All right, so yeah, a lot of times ham radios do have used serial interfaces so you can control them with other devices. And you have software on your computer that's designed to talk to the radio. Correct. And, um, and uh, of course, modern computers don't have serial ports anymore, RS-232 ports. They just have USB ports. But you have a cable that converts USB to RS-232. I have three of them, and I've tried all of them. And uh, uh, is it that the computer software doesn't see the radio? It's that the computer can't find the serial or the the. Uh, well, US, <clears throat> the USB adapter will or should look like a COM port to that software. It does not. Okay. And that's the problem. Yes, I, I amazingly. <laughs> I remember all of these things from, from, the, from days gone by. Um, and I'm a ham, but I'm a bad ham. So I, I've... WT. Yeah, W6TWT. Yeah, what's your call sign? AK4ED. Nice to meet you, AK4ED. <laughs> so um, I guess the issue is this serial to USB, although I have to say uh, I know a lot of hams... And a lot of ham radios come with RS-232 ports, and obviously uh, it, it, that should work. Now, I'm looking at the chat room, and we have a number of hams in there. Creamy Corn Cobb says, I have used the exact same thing and never got it to work. 
That's encouraging. Has it ever worked for you, or has this never worked for you? Well, it worked on a on a on a uh, PC, but not on a Mac. Oh, it's a Mac. Yeah, oh, Macs don't know COM ports. Well, probably not. That's no, they've never had COM ports. Um, with my Dell, it worked just fine. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense because Windows has a long memory. One of the things Microsoft does is make sure that old stuff works. Uh, it's it's uh, they're famous for it. It's also kind of a a cross they have to bear. Apple's famous for saying to the uh, people with older hardware, "The heck with you." We're moving on. Um, so, yeah, it sounds like something that would work with Windows. Now, uh, what's the name of the software? Is it from Kenwood? No, it's uh, third party. It's the only kind that, it's the only program I found out there. It's A E R T H A or something yeah. like that. Yeah. And does it say it will work with this kind of a setup? Yes, it does. Okay. Because obviously it's a Mac program, so it's supposed to work. Correct. The only one I can find that will work, and uh, so I don't know. Anyway. I my guess my guess is you know so first of all you need a driver that will interpret the serial uh, the uh, USB port as a serial port and then interpret and then tell the the software oh it's COM port four and the software will go oh yeah of course and what's the baud rate and it'll tell it that uh, that's a driver set up properly with everything turned on yeah and I've got my computer as that's well, a that's a driver issue. Yeah. So, and of course, Windows, <laughs> of course, Windows has drivers for that kind of thing because people do that. I'm wondering, did, did any software come with the USB to COM port adapter? Uh, yes, it did, and I have uh, used that, and it said that it didn't need it, but I installed it, put the driver in where I was supposed to, uh, and uh, did everything that it, the instructions told me to. I looked online and gone to the forums, but a lot of those are screenshots, and my voice over right. a screenshot. So that's useless <laughs> to me. So All right, I have found a site uh, that you should be able to read in your screen reader. It looks like a very simple text-only site, Mike's PBX Cookbook. And oh, this okay. is not specifically for ham radios, but it's the same issue. If you have a, uh, a TTY that you want to control with your Mac... Uh, you have the same problem. You have a serial port uh, and you have a USB port. And he has some drivers on here. He also has, really interestingly, some Macintosh command lines ah. that might help you. says, after installing the correct driver, plug in your USB serial adapter, open a terminal session, enter the command ls slash dev slash cu dot star, which will give you a listing of CU devices, which I guess is what these devices look like. And then you can do some more command line kung fu to get it to work. So I am not going to walk you through this because everybody's going to glaze over. But I it's pbxbook.com. I got it. And I suspect this will help you. I mean, certainly this is exactly what you want, which is interfacing Macs with USB ports to serial TTYs. In this case, it's not a TTY, it's a radio, but it's going to be exactly the same kind of thing. Okay. Does that well, make sense? Three. We'll have a good vacation. Okay, 7-3, sir. Thank you. And uh, we'll see you on the, uh, on the airwaves. One last call. We'll try to get it in. Earl from Arcadia. Hi, Earl. Hi, Leo. Thanks so much for helping me. What can I do for you, sir? I have an iPhone 5S with Verizon for the past several years. My contract is up. I'm doing month to month now. Uh, they discontinued my uh, all you can eat uh, data plan a yeah. couple of years ago. Yeah. And even though I don't uh, play games or watch videos, I'm using up my allotted two gigabytes every month. Yeah. So I'm thinking of uh, selling out perhaps to Sprint or. I'm open to an So Sprint and T-Mobile both have unlimited plans. That's what happens when you're number three and four, right? You have to try harder. And uh, Verizon and AT&T don't like unlimited plans. They, the AT&T chairman said, the worst thing I ever did when the iPhone came out was agree to unlimited data. And they've been trying to phase people out. So, But here's the thing. You can on the iPhone, uh, iOS 8 or later, 
you, if you go into your general settings and you look at your cellular set, uh, I think it's cellular, it might be usage settings, you can see how much data, how much cellular data each program's using. And you can even say individual program by program, don't use cellular data. Don't use, cell yes, okay, you can. So you may find that you can, two gigs is a lot. You'll first of all see who's using all that data, and you may find you can turn off some of those things and save yourself some data. So I would do that first. But then, I'm a happy T-Mobile customer. Unlimited data is great. Highly recommend it. Leo Laporte, the Tech Guy. Have a great Geek Week. Stay cool. Well, that's it for the Tech Guy show for today. Thank you so much for being here. And don't forget, it's just the tip of the iceberg. We do nearly 30 shows on the Netcast Network. It's called TWIT, T-W-I-T. It stands for This Week in Tech, and you'll find it at twit.tv, including the podcasts for this show. We talk about Windows on Windows Weekly, Macintosh on Mac Break Weekly, iPads, iPhones, Apple Watches on iOS Today, Security and Security Now. I mean, I can go on and on and on. You even get your daily dose of tech news with Tech News Today. And, of course, the big show every Sunday afternoon, This Week in Tech. You'll find it all at twit.tv. And I'll be back next week with another great Tech Guys show. Thanks for joining me. We'll see you next time.